The first time I played the drum was 1993, March on Washington for Gay Pride and Lesbian Rights. A bunch of friends had got together and we went to Washington to march and we met in a park and someone had brought a drum set that they had taken apart and they were passing out pieces of that drum set and they asked me, would you like to play? And I hesitated at first, but then I thought, hmm, something to hide behind. So I strapped on the drum, I grabbed a mallet and off we went marching through the streets of Washington, D.C. for liberation, for identification, the right to be who we were. And I played. And we marched and marched and I played and played and time stood still for me because suddenly I felt I could breathe, that this noise that had been in my life all my life was beginning to settle down, beginning to be a little quieter. And we marched and we marched and I played, dun, 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 and I played and I played and finally hours had passed and miles had been marched and we stopped. I took off the drum, and as I took off the drum, I looked down at my hands, and I had blood blisters all over my hands from playing that drum, blood blisters that I had never felt the entire time we were marching. But I knew that there was something in this thing, something in this rhythm in the drum, something that was quieting that noise. There had, there had always been noise in my life, when I was three years old, my mother was shot and killed in our home. My brother, my sister, myself, we were all there. And it was there that I learned that there is danger in loving someone as hard as you love a mother because that person can be taken from you. And so I learned not to feel and not to show emotions and how to keep everything inside. And I always looked like I was all right on the outside, but on the inside, I was broken. And that's where that, that noise began. My mother had taught me before she died how to read. And it rescued me, it saved my life, it helped me to get out of myself. And so when my grandparents came and got us, and took us from Portsmouth, Virginia to Washington, PA. That's what I did, I read. And I would go up in the attic. There was a small front room, which was a kitchen, and then a larger back room, which was actually the front of the house, which was a bedroom. My grandparents had taken in boarders for years, but at this time there was no one living there. And I would go up in the attic and I would read. I would read encyclopedias, and I would read child craft books and medical journals, anything I could get my hands on to help me escape the reality of being a little black girl in a world where little black girls were raised more than they were loved. And so I would read, and I would read, and I would read, and it would help to settle that thing inside me. Some months later, after Pride in Washington, D.C., we had returned back to Pittsburgh, and someone was having a Sunday brunch in their backyard to listen to an NPR broadcast on racism. And we all gathered in the backyard, and artists were invited, dancers, actors, writers. I was a poet, and we were supposed to listen to this broadcast on racism and emote. And I was sitting over in the corner and I'm writing my poetry. And I'm writing and I'm writing and I hear the gate and I look up and two women enter. One black, one white, and they're carrying congas. And they come in and they put the drums down and people greet them and I keep my head down and I keep writing. 
and writing. And, and the white woman comes over to me and she says, do you want to play? And I said, no. And I kept writing and writing. And then she asked me again. And there was something in the way she was asking me that made me think that because maybe I was the only other black person in the backyard that she thought I wanted to drum. <laughs> and so I was resistant and I kept writing. And she asked me again and I'm like, why does this woman? And the other woman said, hey, I'll show you what to do. And I sat down behind the conga and she showed me the boom, bass. And she showed me the tone and the clack of the slap and I boom pa crack boom pa crack and I began to play and I was hesitant at first and then the rhythm kind of caught me up and I started playing and making more noise and getting that boom clack pop together and we played as if we had been playing forever and that noise in my life began to settle down. It began to quiet and the breaths came easier. And so I knew that there was something in this thing called a drum for me, but I didn't know where to go. And shortly after that time, I found a group of women who had a drumming class and I would go to that drumming class and I would play and I would learn rhythms and learn how to play with other people and learn that tone, slap, bass a little bit better. And then people began to complain a little bit that I played too fast and that I played too loud and I wasn't patient enough. And here I was finding that thing that was helping me to settle and someone was kind of pulling it away from me. And so I learned how to be small. I learned how not to play too fast and how not to play too loud how to make other people around me comfortable, but I knew that I needed this drum. And so I continued to search and seek because I needed more. I wanted to find out where did it come from? What is the history? So one day I was walking in Wilkinsburg past a store called the Wood Street Emporium, and I heard African music coming from inside. And so I re-backed up and I went into the store. And when I entered that store, I was a customer, then I became an employee, then I became a family member, and it was there that I found the rhythm of West Africa. The owner would sit in the back with me and show me the different sounds and show me the accompaniment parts and the top parts and the polyrhythms of the djembe, and we would play together. And I got so good at it that he actually asked me to go and play with his group but it was a hard, hard world to break into because here I was, this black lesbian woman trying to play the drum and everybody wanted me to dance. <laughs> and I didn't want to dance, I wanted to play the drum. And so the day came for the gig at the Homewood Library that he invited me to play at and I got all Africaned up with my African garb and I grabbed my drum and I march and I get there and I'm about to go up the steps. And this woman steps in front of me and says, where are you going? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play with them. And she said, no one told, and what she was saying was, no one told her that that black lesbian chick was going to show up to play. And she blocked my path because in the world of drum and dance, there is an energy that's created between the drummer and the dancer, a synergy, a pull and a take. A, it's almost sensual. And here I was showing up in the mix and throwing the norm off. And I heard someone call my name and they said, Kelly, come on, bring your pill and come on over here. She's with us. And it was my teacher who I played with in the back of that store. And he called the drum, my djembe, the pill, because he knew it was the medicine I needed in my life. He knew it was that thing that I needed to quiet that noise. Some months after that, the group of women that I had played with previ previously invited me to come to the Jewish Community Center and play a gig. We were the opening act for Susan Westenhofer. 
And I got all butched out because I knew there were going to be a lot of girls there. And I got all butched out and had my gear on and I showed up with my drum. And in practice, they had given me some leads to play. And so I had my shaker ray and my bell and my djembe all nicely tightened. And I got there and we sat down and I began to play. And at first it was a slow kind of boom, 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 da da da, boom, 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 da da da, boom, boom, boom. But then it began to build and it was my turn to play the lead. <laughs> And I was losing my mind and going crazy and playing loud and playing high and playing low and playing like I had never played before. And I could feel the energy coming from the audience. They were clapping, they were stomping, they were yelling, they were appreciating the gift of drum that we were giving. The gift of drum that I was giving, the freedom that I had. And we did the break and it ended. We stood up, we bowed, and people were on their feet screaming and yelling and giving us a standing ovation. And they started to come towards us and, and want to hug us and shake our hands and talk about the drum. And I knew I couldn't sit there anymore. I knew that I had to go. I could feel the energy in the bottom of my feet coming up my legs, in my body. The sweat was beating on my face, and I knew that I had to get out. And so I excused myself and went to the side door and walked out into the warm summer night, and I began to run, running around in circles in that parking lot. See, I wasn't running away from anything. I was running to something. I knew that I had found the answer in the drum, and I began to understand that when something is meant for you, no one can take it from you not even yourself.